Perfect. So then let's start. My name is Stefan, Stefan Sam, organizing this meetup now since a couple of years. And I'm very glad it's still going on. We made this online version too. So we went through Corona. Despite there are now thoughts to really also get a local regular meetup, I'm not planning to skip the online versions. Um, it's easy going for everyone and also for me. Hence, I'm looking forward to a couple of more online sessions. The next are also planned. And today, um, our topic is optimization. An introduction session from our Fall in Love with Julia summary. Um, so we have a lot of sessions already in this series. So if you go to the GitHub page, um, Fall in Love with Julia on Julian.io, you see there's really a lot going on already. We went through a couple of topics and today the last one, an optimization topic, which is um, as a package, part of the scientific machine learning ecosystem. Hence, you see the CIML here. What we are going to see today is kind of really the basics, which I compiled a little bit from the tutorials and a little bit from our own work to really get it bare bounds. And yeah, so we first go through, look at the optimization package itself, then have two specifics um, that we can use derivatives, so also automatic derivatives, and we can also use constraints. And then that comes kind of the most interactive part of today, where I kind of prepared a lot of slots to fill in by you. So we're going to optimize a neural network with this. If we have time, we can also switch the neural network backend, but let's see, um, um, because they're at the, as of now, two different neural network packages, which are very, very similar, but slightly different. And it's interesting to see how they interact with optimization or how you make them interact with optimization. And last one is kind of a little extra um, that you that this whole interface is also well equipped with symbolic support. support. And this is actually yeah because of its tight in integration with the scientific machine learning, where the symbolic part is already also quite old. Yeah, so this uh, standard Jupyter notebook and binder environment, um, it may fail because you're not going to interact with it. <laughs> I'm not sure what the timeout is, 15 minutes or something. And then you need to restart it and you restart it by clicking on this top link. So if I click on this right now, I get a new tab, which is really spawning now a new binder environment of the very same notebook. So this is the, the simplest way to restart the system. So this launch button at the top always brings you to the very same environment, but a, a newly spawned one. Okay, so there we are. I'm now using the second one. Um, first, for all of you who join me now here live, um, it, I ask you to execute the first cell right away. So uh, just to yeah, spare some time, we are importing a couple of packages and yeah, it usually um, does it a bit longer. Not sure how, how long it's going to be now, but it's good to execute it. Um, so you execute it. I'm always using shift and enter or you also have this run button here at the top. With this, you can execute an arbitrary cell. Okay, so optimization. Optimization is actually something which was scattered around many, many pay packages in the Julia ecosystem. So there are many different fields which have their own style of optimization. We are going to see kind of, I would say at least two different styles today. And yeah, and the optimization.jl package um, was one approach to unify this now into one interface. Hence, it's really worth knowing because it's yeah kind of an, an easy go to, to get some optimization routines into your workflow. And it's also if you want to clean up your code, your current code, yeah, it makes makes sense to give optimization a try because everyone's going to understand optimization. Nevertheless, it's um, relatively young still. And yeah, but 
Yeah, so let's take a look. Optimization from the page, this quote, I think it's worth um, quoting here, is a package with a scope that's beyond a, your normal global optimization package. Optimization seeks to bring together all of the optimization packages that can find local and global into one unified Julia interface. This means you learn one package and you learn them all. Optimization adds a few high level features such as integrating with automatic differentiation. We're going to see that to make its usage fairly simple for most cases by allowing all of the options in a single unified interface. Okay, so initialization is gone, is, is done for me. So we go on and get our main optimization problem to, to just get a, a feeling of optimization. This is also the example taken from the documentation. It's the Rosenbrock function. And yeah, so this picture is from Wikipedia so that we directly have a a little understanding. And you see it has an intuitive um, V shape or banana shape. However, um, it's actually, the minimum is actually here on the one one. So it's a little bit shifted and that makes it an interesting problem. We can also plot this using Julia with a 3D version, just because it's nice to interact with 3D plots in this um, Jupyter interface. And also it gives a, a better feeling of that there is really the minimum. So actually, because I'm going to plot this um, with log scale, um, there's some yeah some difficulties with the Plotly backend. It doesn't really work with the color coding, but it's not so much of a problem because we we nevertheless get a, a nice plot. And yeah, and here's now the log of zero is infinity. So if we zoom in here our actual minimum is not there. It's just kind of, yeah, it's this little hole in here where our minimum is. But other than that, I, th I think it's really nice to see um, that this Rosenbrock function is a really good benchmark case for optimization problems. And yeah, so this is log scale. It's really only small numbers which are going down here. So as always, uh, um, please ask questions. Um, you're also kind of invited to ask kind of some other questions about Julia parts here and there. So we jump in the sense directly into some, some Julia code. And if you're completely new to Julia and have a specific thing which kind of now keeps you away from, from joining, please also ask or, or write into the chat. It's really welcome. Okay, so having such a problem defined. Ah, okay, so <laughs> this was really quick. I'm a bit surprised. So my kernel just died and I'm not sure why. Ah, so I tested it beforehand a couple of times. I hope your experience is a little bit more stable than mine. And my experience was also more stable when testing. Um, yeah, so the plot we don't need. So the next part is um, to, oh, wait, connecting to kernel, my kernel. Yeah, no connection to kernel. So this is the case which I was warning you about. So if you see the sign here on the top right, then restarting doesn't do anything. <laughs> it's really just the, the kernel below or yeah, the Docker container below was killed by a binder for some reasons. Sometimes it's not completely obvious why it was killed, um, but yeah. Still, it's a really awesome support the binder initiative that we get these free environments. And actually a fun fact, if you not, don't access this uh, late in the day, but rather in the morning or on weekends where people don't usually work, then you even get eight gigabytes of memory. Yeah, usually. So this is also scaling down because many are connecting to it. Okay, so we we now going to look into the optimization interface, and I have a little link here. Okay, so the optimization package itself is twofold. And the first one is that we need to define an um, optimization problem. And this is composed of our function, which we want to optimize in this sense, always minimize a starting value, 
of our solution and then some other fixed constants which in the interface are called parameters. So um, yeah, in combination with neural networks, this naming convention is a bit um, unfortunate, so it's not so intuitive. Um, but yeah, keep in mind, despite it's called P uh, in the documentation, the last part here is really rather constants which, yeah, with which you can kind of fix certain things of your function. In our case, the Rosenbrock function was defined with these extra parameters here with the contents, constants, which we also have fixed. So this is more for visualization of the interface. And yeah, so if you defined this um, optimization problem, then you can solve it with a couple of different solvers. And this is kind of the, the second step. And while the, the optimization problem is defined in the optimization package itself, there are now so many optimizers that they, or most of them have their own package where, where they come. And this is now um, the optimjl package, which is wrapped here for optimization. So this is a usual naming convention. You have optimization and then the original Julia package, which was there before optimization and made available for the optimization ecosystem. And yeah, in this little one, we already have kind of three different solvers, which all work um, with, with our part. So we can use a particle swarm, where we just have um, a couple of different solutions, which we try out and um, approximate our derivatives using this particle swarm. We have simulated annealing, which is more um, yeah, a probabilistic approach under the hood and yeah, or a terminal approach depends from, from where you come, from which field. And we have kind of the, the gold standard for derivative-free optimization, which is the melda meat. And yeah, and we see that we kind of get somewhere to one one. Yeah, So the first one is way worse um, than the second and melda meat is by far still a lot better. So this is the basic interface. If you got this, you already got a lot because it it's really kind of the feeling, okay, yeah, I have a problem, I can specify it. And now I can try out a couple of different optimizers and they all work because it's unified in this optimization package. So this is really um, the key part. And what is also really good to know, and yeah, if you're working with Julia for a long time, you keep forgetting it, but you can, oh, okay. So there are really a lot working here. I, I hope we get nevertheless a uh, um, kind of good experience. This is, yeah, this is killed really frequently. Um, okay, but but nevertheless, um, just to get the one main part still, we really just defined an arbitrary Julia function. Yeah, so this is something which I always love about Julia. It's not about using a specific framework now to define your optimization problem. Yeah, but you really just define a normal function. And you can just use that. This is really, um, yeah, the love of Julia that things plug together just in the language itself, not within a, a specific sub package. Of course, sometimes things don't work out, uh, don't interact super well, but still the interactive, the interaction between packages and Julia is, is really awesome. Okay, I, this solve was not necessary. So what I, I um, compiled here is an overview of the um, optimization package itself. And yeah, so these are the, the different existing packages which have been integrated into optimization. And yeah, and there are a lot of different uh, ways to optimize something. So the black box optimization only supports global con unconstrained settings. And this X here is not to understand like, okay, um, optimization misses something here. Now, no, this is really this black box optimization. <laughs> um, this is the table definition. <laughs> this black box optimization does not support local gradient based optimization, local Hessian based optimization, etc. So what is in the stage of getting supported is this yellow blob here. So these parts, they can be supported in principle, but are not yet fully supported. 
So you have a pretty um, huge table with a, a lot of things here. So the most important for me, so I myself haven't tried out all of them. Um, I think the most important is the math opt interface. And this is the one, so I'm back um, interfacing the, the jump ecosystem. So you may have heard of it. That's a mathematical optimization system in Julia, which is one of the oldest and well, most well supported um, ecosystems in Julia to, to have um, nonlinear mathematical optimizations or convex optimizations. Um, yeah, and conic optimizations and a lot of uh, special optimization problems. And yeah, it's also integrated here for this generic optimization interface. And two other ones which are um, important. Ah, yeah, so actually you see there's even one missing here. Um, the Optum we're going to see a lot. This is kind of a standard um, package which we already used. Um, this is the Optum JL, um, which is here abbreviated as just Optum. And yeah, it gives you a lot of support for well-known um, optimization algorithms, which also use derivatives. And we're going to see another one later, which is the optimizers, which is not listed here even. Um, just, yeah, I'm not sure why, why it's not listed here. Probably needs to be added soon. And the, this one is going to be then used for neural networks. Okay, so let's go in. Um, yeah, last part of this introductory part of, of the talk is to look at what we actually get out of the solve call. So the, the solution here um, prints as the solution of our system, which we named U, and which is kind of normally named U in this optimization convention. Um, yeah, this is because it lives in the scientific machine learning system. And this was mainly inspired by differential equations. And there you use U, or well, often you use the, the variable U to abbreviate the state of your system. And in general, in Julia, we can use kind of some helper functions, uh, field names, uh, which expect a type. So we need to use type of. And then we can see, OK, what this thing actually supports um, by means of the dot accessor. And we have this u itself, yeah, which is really just the same, which is directly printed. And really good to know in a couple of source code here and there, this is also a common way to access this underlying you or this underlying optimized parameter. And yeah, because it's really common, it's good to have seen at least once. But we have a couple of more. We have the original problem, we have the original algorithm. These are the two parts which we plug together, problem and algorithm. Yeah, so they are still preserved here. And we have the minimum, which is the minimum of our function where we arrived at. And we have a return code, which just tells us whether we um, converged successfully or whether we are stuck somewhere or yeah, um, yeah get to infinity or don't know what, what can all happen in such optimizer routines. And we have also called or solution original, which is kind of the a wrapper around the original solution of the un underlying optimizer. So <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about switching to my own system. So I'm I'm very sorry that you probably have a similar experience. Um, just for the sake of um, better following also in the in the video, there's a, a, a simple way to just that you see it. It's actually really nice. So you can execute, you can also spawn this environment on your local setup with the Jupyter repo to Docker um, script. Um, this is just a Python script. You need Docker for it, but that was it. And then you just put the, the URL of, um, uh, of the package, the repository. And I just, for, for those of you who actually have the setup, more information, more details is also put on, on the repository itself. But now I'm just executing this. And because I did this already, I have a um, I have a Docker already running, which is then spawned. I'm copying this URL here, and now I'm on local system. And yeah, sorry for the inconvenience of the bad connection, but still, I think it's it's really a 
a valuable interface to my binder. Could be a bit more stable indeed. Okay, so this is now um, the very same or good to have seen this once. So if you start this, you're actually in the lab interface. You can also go back to the standard notebook by switching to tree. This is probably hard to remember, <laughs> but yeah, okay. So for me, I'm in there, but you can also use kind of the Jupyter lab version. Um, I'm going now to the tree version and there it is. And it's really the very same environment. So this um, is now the same, but we're running locally, so more stable. Okay, so yeah, I actually gave a little uh, mini example here, a mini task for you. So having seen the properties of our final um, of our final algorithm of an, our final solver, the Nelda Meet, which convert, converged. Um, it's really interesting just to inspect uh, what the others um, outputted, whether they thought they converged or not. And this is kind of my, my first little exercise to you. So, um, yeah, so I hope for most of you this experience is more stable, of course. Oh probably a blind hope. I guess just many around the world are connecting to Binder right now. Um, but if not, yeah, just give it a try. So what you would have to do to, to inspect it. And I myself am going to replicate it now as soon as it's there. So actually, I think the easiest version is just to extend these solvers here above a little bit so that they write to the very same variable name solution. And yeah. And I'm then re-executing simulated annealing. Okay, so let's check whether simulated annealing actually converged. So the return code was actually is already false. So in the original message also tells this. So if you kind of like a bit more detail here, the origin is really good to inspect, but for kind of programmatic access to the information whether it converged or not, the return code is the, the important one. So you get a couple of more information here. Um, also what is used for convergence. And we can also kind of check the, the other one, the particle swarm. And this was even worse. So I hope it recognized that it failed. And yeah, luckily it did. Okay, so this was the, the very introduction to this optimization interface. And now we're going to look at this two core functionalities, the derivatives on the one side and the constraints on the other. Okay, so for derivatives, and as always, if you have questions, please um, raise hand, raise voice, or just write to the chat. I'm, I'm checking it again and again from time to time. Yeah, so derivatives. Um, this is really lovely, and Julia, you have a tons of automatic differentiation packages. And it feels like every year a, a new one comes out, which even improves upon the previous one. So a lot of effort is put into this direction. And yeah, for machine learning and especially deep learning, this is also the key part, which put everything apart, that you just had to write your model and the, the differentiation was done for you. You don't have to specify it again. But then Julia, this is really generic. So we can use an arbitrary function and automatically take get the derivative of it. So yeah, arbitrary is kind of a little bit um, yeah relative, but for most purposes it's kind of arbitrary. There are um, two kinds of, um, or at least two kinds. These are kind of the best known versions of differentiation, automatic differentiation. There's this forward mode. Where, which we here execute in the first, it's the forward diff package behind it. 
And we have a reverse mode, which we execute in the second, which is the, the zygote, or it's the most uh, performant version of it. And yeah, so the auto forward diff has kind of, in, in general, kind of these techniques, the forward one is really good if you have only a small number of par parameters that you want to learn. So if you have a huge million parameter neural network, then it's not the best thing. It will scale really badly. So if you have this really huge neural network, you're definitely going for reverse mode. But there is a disadvantage as well. So the reverse mode does not support the full set of Julia. There are other reverse mode packages which support a bit more, but they're less um, speedy. Um, but in case, kind of, if you just want to check out a problem, yeah, then the forward version will always work. Yeah. So this really supports 100% Julia. And it's really nice to, to have this as a fallback in case. Might not be that optimal. Yeah, might take a bit longer, but at least it works with everything. everything. And yeah, with the reverse mode, it might be if you have kind of a mutation, um, heavy use of mutation, which is not optimized away, um, then yeah, you need to check out kind of some other um, packages here. And yeah, so what, what did I now skip about? is that what we now replace is this Rosenbrock before. Yeah, so remember beforehand, we just put the Rosenbrock function directly in here and optimize the whole thing. Now we have an additional layer before that we define the optimization function separately. So this is just the interface um, the optimization package uses. And here we get the auto differentiation uh, as a second argument. And instead we could also um, give the, uh, yeah, we can also kind of define the derivatives themselves here. Instead of kind of using the auto fallback, you can in principle specify the derivative yourself. Um, yeah, it might be an option. You can achieve more performant code if you write it yourself, but yeah, it's most useful to, to get the automatic ones. Okay, so, little exercises on this one here. Um, just inspect it again, the solution. And it would be nice to see whether this one actually was better or worse than before. And yeah, we can just compare the minimum value to do this. So yeah, please be invited to experiment here with me. So I'm just Going for zygote first for reverse mode solution. So this definitely succeeded. <laughs> and okay, there's even the final value already printed. This is that one. And because I was not looking far ahead, I now have to re execute the one beforehand. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, how do I do that now? <laughs> I, I, I renamed the second one. <laughs> so. And get the, the first one. In here. Yeah, and <laughs> it's pretty impressive if you see the, the E potential here on the end. So using the derivatives gave us a a really huge boost and optimizing this pseudo problem, this Rosenbrock benchmark optimization problem. And in general, that's that's really kind of a yeah, an awesome feature to have this auto differentiation everywhere. And what is also nice about it, just to yeah, it's um so it's not yet all auto differentiation packages are, are supported here out of the box. Just there are many, many and enzyme for example, I think is not yet optimal, not yet supported. Uh, let's check um, whether I get an auto completion of auto. Yeah, so I have auto finite diff, or forward diff, modeling toolkit, and um, zygote. We're going to see modeling toolkit also soon. Um, there are a couple of more, and I hope the, the support is going to grow a lot. And one well-known one is enzyme. Also in this realm, 
but yeah, fallback is yet that you can kind of specify your derivative directly here. And with this setup, you can also use Enzyme. That's worth noting. And, and yeah, I hope that someday everything is supported here and then this is a really lovely one fits all setup. Because as of now, you for each de auto derivative package, you also have your own interface. So yeah, there you may need to learn a lot of different APIs. It would be nice to have them all integrated here as well. And yeah, so going ahead, no questions. There's also this constraints part, um, which you don't use that often um, when optimizing kind of neural networks, but for kind of generic optimization problems, this is yeah, kind of standard that you have a couple of constraints. And yeah, and what the kind of constraints we can support here in optimization is for first just lower bounds and upper bounds, which you specify in the optimization problem itself. And yeah, here now I'm again switching to another optimization solver. That's the black box optimization, uh, which has very specific methods. So I myself am not the professional for all these different methods. And yeah, so what we what we said here is actually kind of lower bound minus one and upper bound one. So our true solution is within the ream, within the limits. So we can also find it. And this is then, yeah, perfect, perfect solution. And we can also use this with gradient methods. Yeah, so this is no problem here. And we now have here kind of the BFGS algorithm also from the optim part. And um, there's which have I used this is the same which I've used before for the um, derivatives examples. So this is really the, the status quo optimizer for solving derivative based problems. And yeah, this works together. And in addition to just upper bounds and lower bounds, we can also specify constraints. And the syntax is a little bit alien to admit. Uh, but so you again have kind of this extra p at the end where you get kind of further per, yeah, further constants in. And yeah, and the syntax is here that we don't return our constraints, but for performance reasons, we override them onto a given array. So this dot equal is overriding in place. So element wise in place. And yeah, this just improves performance because this array doesn't need to be allocated every time again. And hence this is a little bit clumsy interface. So yeah, what we do here is just to return an array. So uh, we could also have written it this way. In Julia, normal vectors are column vectors. And you can also use just enters to create kind of a column relationship. So this would work the same. And now you see it a little bit more easily, I think that it's really kind of these two things here. So the uh, sum of the squares and the multiplication, which are now here defined as our constraints. And in the optimization problem itself, um, we again use auto differentiation and we can now specify the lower bounds for the constraints and the upper bounds for the constraints, which now just correspond to these values printed here above in LaTeX. And we optimize um, this with the IP Newton, again, another one. So in principle, you can kind of try out um, many different versions. You can also read kind of a couple of papers. And um, so my, yeah, if you kind of have a, a problem space and you have uh, some work from others, it's always kind of good to kind of take their best, best practice. But um, fallback is just to try out different solvers and see which one works best also in terms of performance. So this one um, worked and we see actually it really um, succeeded <laughs> despite we are far away from 1-1. One, one. <laughs> and this is just because of our constraints. But nevertheless, yeah, this was kind of our optimal, um, optimal solution. And to inspect that we really kind of fulfilled our constraints, we um, can again have a, 
used this above. No, I haven't. Yeah. So we can now kind of fill in the gaps of this weird convention, yeah, which which is there for performance reasons. So we know our constraint function doesn't return anything, but it overrides the first value. So we set an, an array with two elements and right, call our constraints function on it. Actually, this parameter is never used, so we can skip it or fill in kind of nothing. Um, so there's nothing in Julia, but there's also an empty tuple or something. So yeah, and then we print out all the, our overwritten result, which apparently is not zero zero any longer, but was filled in by our constraints. And yeah, and this one works out very well. And yeah, so let's check it. Zero dot eight. Um, so our first version should be smaller equal zero dot eight, and this works. And we have a second zero dot three seven. Um, yeah, which is somewhere in between. So this also worked well. If you want to kind of add some equality constraints, you can do this as well. And you just set the lower bounds equal to the upper bounds. And yeah, now here an example of using kind of a completely different optimizer system, or actually there are two, two new things <laughs> in the background. So the optimizer here is from the uh, math optimization interface, the jump ecosystem. And uh, this is a bit special. You don't see kind of this optimizer iopt, yeah? But you recall the package directly. So this is just, of course, it's possible. <laughs> and you still need the optimization MOI package to implement the solve method here, but everything works out. But it works directly with the original optimizer types. So this is a bit simpler there. You see this one is com more complex um, or at least initializes a bit more. Um, now I get two questions right away. So let's see. Um, first one, thank you. Maybe I missed this because I arrived a bit later. Is it possible to access store the history of the optimization run or sample every nth point? Oh, this is a good question. Um, I, yeah, yeah, so you, yeah, actually you can do this. And, but um, I think the, it's not within, you can't, don't get the history directly, but the way I'm doing it, we're going to see later actually, is that you can add a callback function, which is then called on every iteration. And there you can get access to the current state and yeah and give things back and plot as we're going to do later and yeah and also kind of store the history so this would be the most used way to get the history uh, we're going to see it with the neural network example and yeah, so second question. Is there a reason why cons doesn't follow the mutating function convention? Why not cons? Ah, yeah, yeah. So this is a really <laughs> lovely remark. So in Julia, there's a <laughs> convention, which I haven't followed here for copy and paste blindness. And yeah, so this is, I think the preferred way, you're right. So in Julia, you can just use an exclamation mark as a normal um, letter within your variable names. So this does nothing special, but just names the function differently. And yeah, and we can now um, give the cons function here. Ah oh, yeah, this is probably the reason it was named the way it was, um, because the parameter itself is not with exclamation mark. This um, this is a, a quite detailed question. I'm not sure whether it's actually possible. I'm just curious. Sorry for the little <laughs> um, fallback. So uh, this is a little keyword argument. I'm, I'm curious. Uh, 
uh, I was afraid this is a problem. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah, no, this was me, myself. Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> okay. So nice, very detailed, um, truly a technical reason. So you can't name a parameter with an exclamation mark in the end because it's confused with um, just different spacing, which compares it then instead of setting it. So this yeah, space sensitivity um, makes it now a special case and, and hence the parameter can't include the exclamation mark. <laughs> nice one. Okay. And yeah. So I still agree that it, it's nice to kind of at least name the function this way to see this is really muta mutating stuff. Um, but you didn't have the exclamation mark in the function body. I think I would skip it for now. Um, so I, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Hort. Um, so what I, yeah, what I just showed seems to be kind of a, a syntax problem to the best of my knowledge. Um, but yeah, so this is really still a good remark that we have this convention to um, mark something which mutates instead of returning. And we can then really call this like a normal function name and have the very same results. And yeah, we can also use this equality constraints and solve this and see that things actually work nicely. And yeah, and now it should kind of be, oh, I need to reevaluate the problem because I'm always using the same variables. And you see that we really reach our one and five, 0 0.5, which we set as the equality constraints. So, and also this thing converged. And yeah, it's a good one. Original. Ah, okay, here we don't get extra support. We just get the original optimizer. So we need to access the return code, which is also from the original optimizer. It's also good to see this once. Um, so the return code is not unified, um, but the specific semantics from the optimizer itself. Yeah, and this is because different optimizers have uh, different return codes in, in terms of, yeah, not only converged or not converged, but a couple of more specific return codes. Okay. But here we got um, convergence. Okay, thanks for um, solving the problems in the in the chat. Um, nice. I'm going to look later on it. Okay, so um, what's the time? We have um, three quarters of an hour already. So I'm hoping that we we can finish at eight. Uh, the time schedule. Yeah, so my little exercise here, I think we have time for it. Um, just um, try out another constraint and see whether we can solve it. So I myself haven't tried out it. Of course, this example is um, taken from the original documentation, should work out. <laughs> but this doesn't mean that any example works out. So yeah, let's think what could we try out. Please just go ahead and try out kind of another constraint yourself. I'm just going up to the original plot to inspect what would be nice. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be nice to constrain it towards the left so that we get somewhere near zero, zero as the solution. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. So here I have my last optimization problem. Ah, okay, now I, I, I completely 
uh, misinterpreted my own exercise. Of course, uh, uh, it was originally intended to use uh, other constraint functions, but this is even harder for me to get a grasp on, so I'm just <laughs> using different bounds. So y was actually quite nicely bound and uh, the x I'm going to bound a bit for zero. So let's see. Um, okay. So uh, my solution is on um, zero of y and really the, the optimum I, I got here. So the most right side for, for the x value. This is a bit hard to get your, your mind around. But I was expecting this because yeah, it's always kind of to the right. And even kind of if we go further to the right, it should always keep get the right point, but now getting up. Yeah, okay. So at least it makes sense. I think it's fine to kind of go on here um, as the visual feedback is quite limited in this constraint case. Uh, there's probably a really nice visualization to get the constraints in and just replot your optimization problem. But yeah, that's for a future exercise. Okay, so let's then jump to neural networks um, if you're all fine with it. And yeah, so as told in the beginning, there are as of now two different neural networks packages which are actually yeah, rather used interchangeably here and there and with a preference in the scientific machine learning for actually for the newer one. So here we are going to use Flux, which is the, the older version. And the, the new one is actually called Lux. And let's see how much time is going to, we're going to have in the end. Then we could kind of try to re-implement it with Lux, which is not super much of a problem. Of course, it's a more well known, yeah. So I'm I'm also using Flux here. Oh, and yeah. After importing kind of our standards, ah, yeah. Sorry, I was uh, so I hope yeah. You may have read this before. This warning, I haven't. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I now put you into a bad situation. But uh, in my previous testing, the binder connectivity was much better. Um, however, at this very stage, I was soon reaching the memory limit and it was, uh, maybe it's, this still works and it's kind of here a good idea to restart your kernel. This will still kind of leave everything intact. Nothing is killed in the sense, but you really just lose kind of your previous state and then you re-execute this and have this as the first um, execution which saves you kind of about one gigabyte of memory or something like this. And this is just enough to get, get this running. And hence, I'm also replicating um, the imports here, which you're going to use. OK, so having imported these parts, um, so if you have an eight gigabyte machine, nothing will happen. Yeah, Some may be lucky and have an eight gigabyte container, but most will have a two gigabyte container. Okay, so now we want to do our little own example problem. And because this is a, a really nice little Julia task, um, and also to see kind of some power of Julia, uh, this is my first real exercise for you in terms of, okay, without this, we can't execute the code thereafter. Um, so the task is to get us some data points, namely 128 data points from a polynomial x squared minus 2x. And yeah, and also add some noise if you want. Um, don't need to, but we can. And yeah, so this is your space. I, I hope this is quite easy for you. If not, um, don't, don't mind. So I myself going to um, try it here. Okay. 
This is now the difficulty of an online session. Um, it's quite hard to um, get a, a common ground for for how fast it is. Or not everyone is kind of really joining hands on. So the first part, um, please ignore my words if you want to try it out yourself. Yeah. So the first part is to change, define some x values. On top, we are going to find then this function x squared minus 2x. But yeah, just to have kind of little data points, we need to define some data points. And there's this range function. And if we kind of look at it, um, I, I actually get an error in this style. So it, it tells me also uh, what it supports, but in general in Julia, so you have a couple of extra helpers and in any environment, the add doc command uh, works out to get the documentation. And yeah, it's also easy to remember at documentation, at doc. And you see kind of the different ways what, it, what the range supports and yeah, having used this now for some time. Actually, the first example is already quite nice. Um, so, um, okay, this is actually, <laughs> this is a special case even, it counts towards uh, infinity with 100. So what we really want is to have a start and a stop and also the length. And there are different versions to, to put this in. So the comma is just a positional argument so we can just use um, every argument after another. And the semicolon indicates that everything thereafter is to be parsed as a keyword. So this is the, the uh, meaning of a semicolon in the Julia language. So you see that we can kind of pass everything as a keyword. And yeah. So this at our hands, um, I need to, no, I, I'm scrolling above. I'm deleting this now. So I want to have just a little a range. Oh no, let's do some um, symmetric parts. And the length I specify now as a keyword because it's intuitive. And yeah, and now I get a, a compact representation of this range, which really just captures all these uh, these parts. And yeah, so I can't really plot this yet because I need the second dimension, the y. And y then is our function. And in Julia, we can apply to it's kind of an arbitrary function to an array or a vector by prepending a dot. So we have now um, um, the yeah, exponential here. Uh, with the dot is then applied element wise. You have the minus with the dot, it's applied element wise. And same then for the x. And this should work. Let's see. Yeah, we have a couple of vectors. And now we can use the plots, plots, and get a idea that we do the right thing. So you can simplify this even a bit further, the code, make it a bit nicer, but yeah, this is the generic idea that we can just use normal operators on it. So another nice way to, to do this is kind of, um, we get a function here yeah, and define it really element-wise. And this is also generic. And then we can do the very same with our own function. Apply it element-wise to our x. And you're going to see this is the same plot. It's really working the very same way. That's power of Julia. You can use arbitrary functions and get the same power as with other parts. And this dot here is now applying it element-wise. Okay, so we have kind of a, a nice quadratic function and yeah, this was a space and I prepared a little preparation routine here because we need to bring everything into um, a matrix uh, so a, a row vector. Julia by default um, hands out a, a column vector 
and yeah, we, we are interested here in row vectors. Okay, so now comes the neural network part. And this is kind of one standard way to define a very simple neural network. We have the, the chain, and actually, if we're going to use the LUX um, package, it's going to look the very, very same. Yeah, so all these parts are also supported by, by, um, by LUX, and you can simply use them. So they have the input size, the output size, and the activation function, or no activation function if you leave it out. And yeah, there's, this constructs kind of our flux model or neural network, and we need to um, get a, a special function from flux, the destructure function, which extracts all the parameters which we've used. So this, these are the parameters, and this is now um, a helper function which reconstructs the original model. So hence I gave it this name. And yeah, the way this is now called is to, to first reconstruct our model with the parameters. This is needed because these parameters we are now actually going to optimize via optimization. And then as the original argument to our flux model, we put in our um, X value. So actually what I've missed is now the randomness. Um, I, I'm going to miss it for now. Um, yeah you're invited to add some randomness here. It's very similar. Okay, so next. Yeah, yeah, Braden, you, you named it. Uh, just looking into the shit. <laughs> add some noise. Okay, come, let's do it. Okay, so uh, yeah. Let's see whether this already adds some noise. <laughs> So oh, this was the very, very simple noise addition. And you have, of course, a couple of more um, support um, here for the, for the noise. And yeah, so this is a normal distributed noise. The, the N is for, no, for normal. We have also rand, which is just picking a, ran, um, a random element. And I think if you don't pass anything, it's just, um, let's see, between zero and one. Yeah, yeah, this is kind of uniform distribution. So we have uh, many more supports for random numbers, but it looks actually quite nice having a bit of noise here already. We can increase noise even more if you want. Um, yeah, so this part here is really important. The D structure, this you need to know. Um, to be able to use flux here. And this is how we get a prediction then. Okay, so now the task I have here is to plot both so that we see that we are really bad as of now. So if you want to plot kind of several things at once, um, you, you have the plot uh, exclamation mark, which is uh, mutating the current plot figure. So here the convention really holds the plot exclamation mark is not returning anything on its own, but it's mutating an existing state. Okay, so if we uh, going, uh, yeah, I, I now re-executed this with a random noise, but what I forgot was actually to again put it to a matrix. And if you remember to do this, you're going to see that the plots look super weird. If you just try the same, uh, we have a lot of different plots. This is because um, the plot system um, interprets this metric style now as multiple plots at once. So we can uh, again fix this by transposing the vectors, and then we get our function. And because this is really tedious, um, there's another transpose version called the adjoint, which for real numbers is just the, the transpose. And you can do it by, a, um, I don't know the English word. In German, it's Hochkomma. So yeah, a little tick, the standard tick. And this works as well and looks much neater for interactive investigation. Okay, but this is not enough. We also want to plot um, our prediction. And here we can kind of add this. 
and it's really just the same. We get a second function here and we see, yeah, <laughs> we can do better even for our training data. Okay, so um, we define our loss now because uh, as everything here in optimization, we need to optimize something. And here we optimize our loss function. We get the parameters in and our um, original data. So the X is our input, the Y is our target. We do what we did just now and then return kind of some uh, some loss of your choice. Here it's just the, the absolute, um, the sum of the squared uh, differences. And we can see this dot for broadcasting and yeah, the sum function just supports kind of um, to parse another function as the, as the first argument, which is applied before summing everything up. Okay, so um, to get our first initial loss, we somehow need to fill in these values. Um, X and Y are kind of intuitive, um, but the first one, the parameters, just need to check uh, how the completion works. So we have parameters initial already, and yeah, you need to execute it. Okay, so this is also really high. We can get better. Okay, now we come to the key um, new support part, new feature of optimization. And this is namely mini batches. And yeah, so this is kind of a, a common thing in machine learning or in, the, in deep learning that you use mini batches to optimize. And the key thing is that this adds some extra stochasticity, some extra randomness, which usually helps you. But yeah, this is also um, something difficult for a couple of optimizers. But yeah, many or a couple of optimizers also work very well with it. Okay, so um, here we use kind of another package, the MLUtils, which has a, a function called the data loader. And now, yeah, this is really simple. Yeah, you see, this is doing everything for us. So we define our batch size and apply our data louder. And we get kind of something again with, with a lot of um, support. And so the data loader can do a, a, even more. And the most important part is um, that this mini batches now, actually, you can use this in a for loop. So this is an iterator. And to get the first element of something you can use in a for loop, you call first. So iterating over this thing now gives us parts like this. And you see kind of from the from the scale, okay, this is just one first part of our um, whole function plot. And now comes the, the largest cell for today. So let's go through this big chunk. So we now um, define our optimization routine to optimize our neural network with mini batches. And here comes the, the callback as the first. So I'm going to store the losses and plot them. And then doing this over a call with the callback function, it first um, gets the, the current um, yeah, the current parameters, the current state. So yeah, and this is where we are. I'm very sorry for the confusion. So this um, should be should be this right now. So the P is a little bit confusing. It's even not used because yeah, in the neural network setting now, you usually call what you want to optimize the parameters. And remember, yeah, the actually naming is that the thing you want to optimize is called U from differential equation conventions. So hence, one thing you can do is kind of to not use the p value to be a bit more um, clear here, but you, for example, the theta, which is also, um, you can kind of back, make a backslash, then write theta and press tab, and then you get this nice LaTeX2 UTF-8 conversion. And yeah, and this is just another name for parameters in the literature. So uh, this might improve a bit this, this conflicting naming convention. Okay, what I'm doing here is to collect the losses. This is the first argument, which is always given to the callback, the current loss. Actually, the loss itself can 
um, return several arguments and then there would be kind of um, the, the further arguments would then be also handed over to the callback. So if you don't want, if you want to compute something in addition to the loss, for example, um, you just want to pass out the prediction. Yeah, you want to uh, track the history of your current of your predictions. You can just return the prediction and the loss. So when we get here the prediction, and let's kind of go back to the loss. Yeah, so you would do do like this. Yeah, you would just have a, a second turn value in the loss function. And now I realize that I skimmed over this. So in Julia functions, the last thing is always returned. But in case this is a little bit too magic for you, you can also place a return in front. And this just does the same. So yeah, last thing is always returned. Yeah, but because the question was also asked, it's really good to emphasize this. So you can track whatever you want and it's passed to the callback function. Here we just now track the losses and we're going to plot the losses to get a kind of a nice um, feedback how we're going to improve. We can have an optimization function and because now we we have kind of the, the batches um, support, we, we need to kind of um, fix it a little bit. If you use a global, okay, there's the question, does this impact performance if you actually use a global? So um, as always, usually you're right, yeah. So what I'm using as a global is losses. So this one here has now float 64 array in it. However, um, because it's a global, um, Julia stores it kind of as an, an anything because you could overwrite losses from wherever you want. And yeah, so this is indeed the case. So you get better performance if you wrap it. But usually you're also going to write this into a function, yeah, somewhere into your code. And then this is fully enough, yeah. If you have it in a function, Julia knows, okay, this can't be changed from somewhere else, but just within the function. Uh, it's just if you're on the global scope, Julia has to account for the fact, or it could be kind of in another cell, yeah, in somewhere else, in another function, somewhere in, that you kind of interfere with this global variable. And this slows down things, yeah. So one way to do this, um, um, is yeah, you can kind of put everything. Uh, yeah, so I think the most simple way to do this is just have a let block. So this is a, a detailed um, answer. <laughs> so this one should already solve the um, global problem. So this is a very simple fix. You have a, a special environment in Julia, which is introducing kind of a local scope. So everything which is defined in this let block um, is not put to the global outside. Yeah, just, just the final return value is returned to whatever here. Yeah, and yeah, so this would be kind of a performance improvement already. But uh, yeah, so if you're fine with the performance, um, the interactive style is kind of what's really nice. Uh, readability improves here in the, in the Jupyter notebook. And performance is still kind of okay-ish. Yeah. Yeah, it would be nice. Okay, it would be an interesting part to actually benchmark this. Okay, let's... Um, Nevertheless, move on. Thank you very much for the question. Um, um, actually, the answer in the in the chat is mentioning a, a ref, and this is um, kind of a, a constructor which is really just an, an, a wrapper object, and then you can access the inner object on I think dot x, or you use just brackets, and you get to the inner thing, and because then you're not changing the global reference. Um, it knows which type it is, and this way you can also improve performance. Okay, so um, thing is optimization, the optimization function follows a specific pattern. Yeah, 
We already saw this in the Rosenbrock function. You first get the thing you want to optimize, in our case, our the fetters. And the second part was the constants I always told. And yeah, in the documentation, they are named P. Yeah. We don't need any constants here. And this is kind of the usual thing for you if you just define your functions um, with the focus on what you want to optimize. So hence, we need to wrap kind of our loss function into this little uh, anonymous helper. Yeah, so where the second argument is just ignored. And then now comes also kind of a new thing. We can access now our batches yeah, and forward them to our loss function. How can we access our batches? So this is um, then finally in the solve. So let's wait kind of two further lines. We build our optimization function because we use auto differentiation and we build our optimization problem then with our initial parameters. And yeah, we ignore kind of this constant part. So remember here, there have been the constants as the extra part. We don't have them right now and we can leave them out. Then we have kind of, we have some number of epochs which we define and we're going to use them in a second. And we, we call our solve, solve now in a slightly different way. We use optimization optimizers. These are now the optimizers coming from the um, deep learning ecosystem. So these are the ones from Flux. And it's really cute. Yeah. So if you remember, we've been using um, optim optimizers and now it's optimizers optimization, the optimization optimizers. And you see really everyone in the ecosystem um, thought, okay, we are defining what optimization is. Yeah, this is kind of apparently a common pitfall. And yeah, it's just one view on optimization. Um, and hence you have some funny names like this, optimization optimizers. Okay, so we will get Adam here, the probably most powerful um, optimizer for neural networks. And yeah, in the literature I saw, you use Adam kind of for the first iterations and then for fine tuning you use the bfgs optimizer which we used above which then can give you kind of an extra boost so this was our standard part we have the problem we have the um, solver and we also um you know have now the callback and the interesting part now is here this part is this third positional argument this is the data and it's a little bit um, special. So this uses a little helper from iteration, iter tools, and but this doesn't do anything special. It just it takes the iterator here in front, the mini batches, and concatenates it in this case 500 times with itself, so that we really go through the epochs of the mini batches, and hence the the epochs name also makes sense here. So this is really just one big iterator which goes through all the mini batches and yeah, again and again and again, 500 times in loop. And um, the solver supports this by then um, plugging in only one single batch, only one single iteration to our last function. Okay, so finally I'm going to grab the parameters learned and yeah, this is our minimizer as we saw. Okay, it was a long way here. So now finally I'm going to execute this going to compile a couple of things before, but we soon should see a, a plot. And yeah, so we can do kind of many, many more things. Ah, there we go. Um, so here we get our plot, which is always kind of updated. And yeah, it was quite quick. Um, yeah, and you see actually the number of epochs, <laughs> this is not well named. So um, I did a mistake here. Yeah. This is not the number of epochs, but really the, the iteration number. Um, nevertheless, so what we see here is the loss and log scale, and we see that we improved. Yeah, you get also a feeling, okay, you can probably improve a bit more. Anyway, let's take a look kind of on what we did. Um, yeah, so just to recap this part, because this is really decisive. So you can kind of get access to mini batches here in general kind of to data and forward it to your loss function. And this is the way you do this is by uh, specifying kind of a third positional argument, which is then your iterator, your data iterator. And what we also have been seeing new is this callback function, 
where you get the state uh, of your system. Here, our theta, our parameters, which we want to learn, you get the loss. This is kind of the standard. And you can get kind of extra things which are returned by the loss. And then you can do whatever you want. Yeah, And in this case, I'm going to plot using this show inline, which is going to update um, the plot system directly. So this is a nice little thing. OK. OK, so yeah, <laughs> we have a final loss. So I please just go ahead and so try to do it yourself here. So our loss function was named loss flux, and we need to fill in its parameters. And just to, I think this is also worth seeing. Um, Despite we haven't specified any documentation, we still get kind of a minimal documentation of our loss flux, and which is yeah referring to our call here. And see, yeah, if you use kind of the um, Jupyter shift tab completion, um, I need to press kind of multiple times, two times, and then I also see the same. With this, but yeah, depending on your system, you might not have this extension because you're using an, an older Jupyter. I'm not if you're using this Docker, but sometimes I face this that I have a Jupyter without auto completion and so forth. So it's really worth knowing that there's also this command. Okay, let's now really get this done. We did enough. So I have it handily named par parameters learned. So yeah, and the other arguments have been X and Y. So we get here, and the loss is much much smaller. So let's let's get the the other parameters next to it. So probably remember it was a quite huge number. So we got somewhere. Okay. So yeah, we want to plot our prediction again versus the true solution, and yeah, we already did this. <laughs> And I myself am a bit lazy. I'm going to look kind of, ah, here, there was it. OK. So yeah, we need to combine it somehow as far as our plot. Nothing, nothing really fancy. And we need our new prediction. And this was our reconstruct function. Where we now can input our learned parameters and then apply it to our x values. Okay, and we see we learned something, yeah, and it looks kind of reasonable. <laughs> um, yeah, but still, yeah, you can probably improve. And to see that you can actually improve quite a lot, uh, I, I put this this last exercise here for, for this session. Uh, for this section, um, that we can also plot um, our solution over a much larger range. And yeah, so yeah, and so the the question is kind of how does it go on here? Yeah, so we are from minus ten to to ten. So let's kind of get something from minus twenty to twenty. Now speeding a bit up because we have only a couple of minutes left. And 28 was our size. Um, I have actually a function, my poly, which is handily applied to my x value. And yeah, then I have this that I need to put them to um, row vectors for these um, um, other things to work. Namely, also the reconstruct and flux. Sorry, going a bit far. So, yeah. So without this, um, this convention wouldn't work. I can still kind of work around it, but it's nice to to kind of have this, um, yeah, this broadcasting behavior. Um, and I use learn parameters. Okay, all fine. And then I just replicate the plots. Okay, all this uh, looks like a couple of too many transposes, but OK, it's just for, for the sake of illustration, quick illustration. 
yeah and this is what i wanted to show you so maybe you also been able to to do this um yeah sorry for those who really wanted to try this one and that was a bit too quick um um yeah so you can get a, a couple of things wrong here and it's really worth a lesson to to get them wrong and see okay it makes a difference the one system expects a a row vector and um, usually I'm constructing a column vector. So this is a thing, yeah, which just happens. And you see, yeah, as with everything we just learned on our train data set, yeah, and extrapolating is actually quite tough, even for something as simple as a polynomial. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why feature engineering is still important even today that there's deep learning. <laughs> so if you have kind of a good understanding of your domain which you're working in, um, use this knowledge, put it into your system, your thing which you want to optimize and will definitely improve your match. Okay, so um, final minutes, there's a remark here from, from my side. Uh, this mini batch support is really nice. It's cool that it's there, but it's not there for every optimizer. So um, it happens that these optimizers from the deep learning ecosystem and also the OptimJL, they support this data, this third argument, this data argument, but not everything. So for example, what we also saw, the jump interface, the math optimizer uh, interface, this doesn't support this data attribute. And Sometimes it might be because it just isn't supported. Yeah, you could in principle support it, but it's really good to know that there are also theoretical reasons against it. So a couple of solvers really need to assume that what you're going to optimize is deterministic. And having mini batches, you get kind of a randomness in it, which yeah might just not work with the mathematics um, behind the optimizer. So, yeah, this is kind of one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, it helps for many deep learning tasks to get this mini batches, but it also kind of can trick your solver that it, yeah, it actually doesn't guarantee convergence or something as soon as you add this randomness. And yeah, and this might be a, a tricky part. And it's good to know that this is a potential pitfall. So that really solvers can lose their mathematical stability and properties just because you use mini batches and introduce some stochasticity in it. Okay, with this in mind, it's still a lovely feature that you can use this right away with optimization. Okay, so last part, just to have this extra um, executing it right away. <laughs> You can also optimize symbolically, and um, this is also kind of just good to know. You can do a lot of more things with symbolic stuff. This is the modeling toolkit ecosystem, which describes now your optimization system using symbols and can do a lot more optimizations on the symbol level. So it just works kind of optimizing. Um, you have kind of gradients, you have Hessians, and you have them in symbolic ways. And you have a, a couple of more, so the documentation tells, um, you have also autoparallelism, sparsification, which is really an, a huge feature, are depending of course on your scientific background, but it might really be that sparsification is the breakthrough to solve your problem. And a couple of more things. And all this is also integrated in the differential equations ecosystem. This is where the scientific machine learning comes from. So we have also symbolic support for differential equations and get this all together. So this is really good to know. And just one final note, because we have been using it already. You have also this um, symbolic part. Um, I mean, sorry for the scrolling. So, I need to search it. <laughs> we have been using it beforehand. There it is. So uh, one of our optimization problems used auto modeling toolkit as the auto differentiation system. So this is also one of the ways you can compute derivatives automatically for you. This is also supported here for arbitrary function. 
So here we already have been using the symbolic support as one alternative to compute gradients. Okay, so with this, we've almost reached eight o'clock. And yeah, so just one, one remark to our optimization. Um, we have been using Lux, uh, Flux, and there's also Lux. And just that you have seen this once, um, so Lux actually um, has explicit state handling in case you stumble upon this, yeah? Just um, one way to have explicit state handling is again by, by using a ref. And yeah, so you have kind of a, a loss function, which is going to return a bit more. So this is a bit specific, but be with me. So let's name this Lux. And you can kind of define your your loss function. Yeah, we have kind of these things which we get here. We really hand this over. This is um, now the, the multi-line part. And with the loss function from a Lux system, we usually get our loss and a state. Yeah, and then we we need to return the loss for optimization to work. And it's one question: what to do with the state? And yeah. And one way to do this is to, to really store this kind of in an outer state. And this is then kind of where a ref comes in. Yeah. So um, initial state or something, yeah. And you can just simply use this style. This is just useful that you've seen this once, yeah. So you can use assignment with a destructuring on, on the ref by using these brackets here. And then you're updating kind of the state and yeah, and then usually your loss function needs to get the state also as another argument and you do it like this, you get the argument in and override it. So this is the way you can, can get um, a Lux explicit state into the system. So just for, for those who have been using Lux, yeah, this is a trick, a little bit more complicated, but um, still um, nothing too fancy. You just um, have the the implicit parameter handling than via this ref. Okay, so with this, there's one further, or one last question. Um, I'm, I'm there also for further questions. Is function local state going to interfere with multi-threading? Yes, sure it is, yeah. So you have to keep in mind um, if you're going to use threading. Um, it might be, uh, so ref is probably thread safe, um, yeah, but still, of course, your your function itself might introduce a racing condition. I haven't checked this. I think this is, yeah, um, not sure. Uh, I guess it's not uh, introducing a racing condition. Um, so one, it's kind of the same. So one thing which kind of simplifies this part, if you don't need the state during the optimizer, or most often you don't need it, you can simply forget it, yeah. And especially keeping in mind that a couple of systems are really um, hard um, to optimize, or a couple of optimizers don't really work with the stochasticity, yeah, even with the mini batches. Same goes for this initial state, yeah. So the state is kind of another kind of randomness which gets in and your optimizer might lose its mathematical properties just because you use the state. So if you don't have kind of a self-updating state, things are much safer for you. And if you have the self-updating state, um, yeah, be careful. Um, yeah, not only with distributed computing, with multi-threading or uh, multi-core or multi-machine computing, but also just because of mathematical reasons that your optimizers might not work with this added stochasticity. Okay, so that was um, again kind of a lot input for today. I hope you you enjoyed the um, the notebook. I hope um, if it didn't work for you today, then at least kind of under normal working hours the um, binder ecosystem is strong enough to give you a stable experience or just as a fallback do it as I do yeah use this Jupyter um, docker to to notebook or how was it named um, helper so I need to get that right 
uh, Jupyter repo to Docker. And yeah, it's really just as simple as putting the URL there and you get this interface as a stable interface with as many gigabytes, gigabytes as you have on your system. Yeah, so thank you also for joining. If you have questions, you can always reach out to me also um, via mail or discourse on, on Julia Lang or Meetup, um, anything. And if you have kind of someone who needs support with Julia, also remember me and Julien.io. So yeah, we want to spread Julia. If there are no further questions, um, then yeah, I wish you all a, a lovely evening. Thank you too.